guys, it's Trevor coming to you with another video. And today we are going to be talking about the get random function in PowerShell. So some of you who are experienced with PowerShell might be familiar with the get random command. Now, if you just run get random by itself without any parameters, you'll get back an integer value that you can use inside of your scripts. However, there's a couple of additional use cases in get random as well. And specifically today, I want to talk about how you can improve the randomness of the results that you get from the get random function. So let's go ahead and start out by grabbing a variety of values. So I'm gonna use the range operator in PowerShell, the uh, dot dot, and pipe that into a for each loop. So basically I'm just saying, run this for each loop a hundred times. And the code we're going to run inside the for each loop is just get random with a minimum of zero and a maximum of 100. Actually, minimum of one, maximum of 100. So we're generating 100 values anywhere from one to 100. So if you run that, you're gonna get back a bunch of integers, which looks all fine and dandy. However, what happens when you take that and you start to group the data. So we'll pipe all those into the group object command. So if we hit F5 and run this, it's going to take all of these integers that were generated and it's going to group them together and tell us how many of each integer we get, we had. So it looks like PowerShell is locking up on me here. So I'm just gonna do a PowerShell restart current session. And let's hit F5 to try to run this again. So as you can see, we have a bunch of random values. And let's go ahead and increase this to maybe 5,000. So we'll get some more random values. And then we have all these grouped objects. So basically this, this property count here is telling us how many we have. And the name here is the actual integer that was generated by the get random. So what I'm gonna do is take that output from group, ob group object and then do a sort by the count property. So if we run this, you will notice that basically for each integer from one to 100, we are getting kind of a roughly equal number of each integer. So the idea here that I'm trying to demonstrate is basically that there's not all that much randomness. We're actually getting a, fair, a reasonably even distribution of randomness, which is not necessarily what we want. We, we want to see some outliers. We want to see some kind of interesting data. So, you know, I would like to see, you know, one of the randomly generated integers having maybe, you know, 500 instances and another one only having three. Uh, that would be a little bit more of a, a delta between those values. And that would make our generated data a little bit more interesting to look at. So what I want to point out to you is a parameter on the get random command called set seed. So the set seed parameter allows you to provide an integer as input. As you can see, it's a nullable integer is the value type that we're expecting here. And we're basically going to feed it some randomness and we're going to use that randomness or that seed value in the get random command to improve the randomness of our output that we're generating here. So how do we get a unique seed value? Well, one of the ways that I have found that you can get a unique seed value is to use output from the get date command. So obviously time is constantly changing. Um, the time on uh, the Windows operating system, I believe is based on like January 1st, 1901 or something, whatever, I can't remember exactly what the epoch is of Windows, but basically, you know, Windows is tracking time from an epoch, a, a static point in time in history, and we're basically counting the number of ticks uh, every, I think, 100 nanoseconds or something like that, but it's basically each tick is a, a small interval from that epoch. So the get date command, what you don't see being spit out here, is the number of ticks since the epoch. So what we can do is take the output from get date, which is actually a date time object, 
And by default, PowerShell just displays that date time object in this nicely formatted string. But there's actually a lot of other interesting properties on that object as well. So if you pipe get date into format list, you'll actually see a vertical list of all the properties that are available on that date time object. Now, one of those properties is right here called ticks. And that's what we just talked about. It's the number, number of ticks since the epoch of the operating system. So what we can do is take that ticks, and if we, if we keep running line number eight here, if I just hit F8 a bunch of times, you'll actually see, if you just track the last few digits of the ticks, that those digits are constantly turning over uh, because there's so many ticks going by every second. So what we want to do is basically take a last, the, the few of those digits that are constantly changing and feed that into the set seed parameter of get random, and that will help to improve our randomness. So let's test out that hypothesis. So what I can do is come up here to my get random command, and in the set seed parameter, I'll do get date, and I'll wrap it in parentheses because I want to reference a specific property on it. And then I'll do dot ticks. And then I'll do my minimum of one and maximum of 100. So now we are doing the same thing as we did above here, except that we're adding the set seed parameter with the ticks. But what you're going to notice here is that if we hit F8 to run that, we actually get an error. And the error is basically saying, hey, I can't take this long ticks property and convert it to a 32-bit integer. And why is that? Well, if you were to take that get date output and pipe it into get member instead of format list, what you'll notice is that the ticks property is actually a long, which is a shorthand for a 64-bit integer. So the set seed parameter on get random is expecting a 32-bit integer, but we are actually feeding it a 64-bit integer by using that ticks property. So what we can do is basically truncate that ticks property down to a fewer number of characters that would represent something within the range of a valid 32-bit integer. So what I'm going to do is convert that long to a string by calling the toString method on the ticks property. So I'm going to take that 64-bit integer, convert it to a string, and then I'm going to take the substring, I'm going to call the substring method on that string and tell it to start at index 9 into that array of characters. So basically what we're doing is if you look at the ticks uh, property here, we're basically going in nine digits, and then we're taking whatever's left from that, and we're going to use that as our 32-bit integer. So let's go ahead and actually just copy this, this part of the line. And I'll copy that into a separate line here just so it's a little bit more readable. So now I'm just doing get date ticks, taking the 64-bit integer, converting it to a string, and then going to index 9. So now what we're doing is we're actually, uh, let's actually do a 10 here. Uh, sorry. Let's try 8. OK, let's do 8. So we're actually going to shave off 8 uh, instead of 9. So now we aren't leading with a 0, which is a good thing. So let's go ahead and just try to convert that to an int 32. OK, that, that is too large. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch it back to 9. OK, and now we are successfully doing a cast. So we're casting from a string back to a 32-bit integer. Uh, so now we're basically going to, now that we have this conversion down, we're just going to take that and we're going to feed it into the set seed parameter. Now you don't have to do an explicit cast like I am here. You don't have to wrap this in a int32 because if you take that trimmed string and feed it into the set seed parameter, PowerShell will automatically figure out how to cast the string into a 32-bit integer for you. So you don't necessarily have to do that, but if you want to be a little bit more explicit in your code, uh, certainly not going to argue with that by any stretch. So let's go ahead and hit F8. And you can see we're still just getting back random values, right? But to measure the difference between our first command up here, where we just ran get random without a seed, let's go ahead and just copy this down. So now we have a version that has 
no set seed. And then we're going to move the version that has set seed inside this second block for each block. So let's go ahead and select the second one that has the set seed and hit F8. And now what you'll notice is that we're starting to get a little bit more randomness in the integers that are being generated by the get random command. So whereas previously with the first version that doesn't use set seed, we're getting a pretty uh, kind of level set of values here. So we've got like 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, et cetera, all the way up to 65. 65 is the maximum count out, out of 5,000 of the same integer, in this case 91, that we're generating. But when we use this, the set seed value with that ticks property, we're actually getting some more interesting data. So now one of these integers is actually 113 instances of it. And you know, on the bottom side, one of these integers only has three instances of it. So now we're starting to generate a little bit more randomness inside of the values that are being spit out from the get random function. Now, there is one other use case for get random where if you take a look at the documentation for it, so let's do help get random. And if you look at the parameter sets, so basically there's two different ways that you can invoke get random. We've been using this parameter set right here where we specify the maximum and the minimum and the seed value, but you can also pass in an array of objects. So the other use case that I just wanted to show you really quickly here is let's generate uh, a bunch of random names. So I'm going to use a module called name it. You can install it from the PowerShell gallery very easily. Just do uh, install module, name, name it, scope current user, like so. So that'll install the module. And then do uh, just one to 10. So we're gonna do a range. And then we're gonna say for each item in that array, uh, just generate a person. So person is a function inside of the name it module. And so if we were to run that, I'll hit F8 on line number 18. Oh, looks like I need to actually install the module. Sorry, I thought I had it installed locally. This would just take a moment here. Okay, so the issue here is that I actually have another module installed that already has a conflicting function name uh, called PSHTML that I did a different video on. So what I'm going to do is tack on the allow clobber, and then I'm going to show you how I can explicitly call a function from the name it module where there's a, a naming conflict. Great, so now I've got it installed. And so when I call this person function, if, the, if this for some reason conflicted with another module, uh, I know I'm getting a little off track here, but I could actually just prefix the module name uh, with a slash, a backslash, and then the function name that I want to call. And that will force PowerShell to invoke the name it module uh, person function instead of the conflicting module. So the person function is not the one that was conflicting. It was the address function. But I did just want to show you that if there is a conflict, that's how you can uh, call a specific function from a particular module. So back to our topic here, I'm going to generate 10 random names into an array. And I'll assign that to my people as a variable. So now I've got this my people variable. And if we inspect it, These are the names that I have in my new array. And because I reran that command, these names have, of course, changed, right? And now I have a new set of 10 names. So now that I have it stored in a variable, uh, I'm going to take my people and pipe it into the get random command. So if I hit F8 on line number 20 here, you'll see that I am starting to just take out of those 10 names that are stored in that variable, now it's just picking out a random name from that list. So you can call get random using that seed value either by, uh, either by getting integers using a minimum and maximum integer that you want to retrieve, or you can pass in an array of objects and it will feed uh, one of those objects out of the array for you. Or you can specify the count and say, well, get out of that array of 10 objects, give me two of them.
And so now it's picking two at random. And keep in mind that the set seed parameter is available on both parameter sets. So whether you're generating integers or whether you are selecting random objects out of an array, the set seed parameter will work on either of those. So thanks for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please leave a like if you enjoyed the video and would like to see more content on my YouTube channel. Otherwise, uh, hit the subscribe button and make sure you're keeping up to date with the latest videos that we publish here. And we will see you next time. Cheers.